We're here with Chris Panayotu, founder of Capitalize Your Finances. Chris, what's up? Mark, it's great to be here. And also shout out to you nailing my last name on the first try. Most people absolutely obliterate it. So I know this is already going to be an amazing podcast. That's what we do. I do not make mistakes. However, many of you out there are making financial mistakes. So that's what I want to talk about today. Let's talk about the top seven financial mistakes that business owners make. Take it from the top. What's the number seven on your top seven list of financial mistakes that business owners make? So you want to go from seven to one being like least to, to most uh, as far as like the biggest heinous. Issue. Yeah. yeah like, and you're going to have to listen to the end to get that most heinous mistake that you're making, but we're going to top at number seven. So number seven, let's say is like a stub toe. And by number one, it's going to be like, you're hemorrhaging out your abdominal. So let's start with number seven on your top seven list. <laughs> okay. I was going to say going from like toe to like a broken ankle, but at that point, like number one, you're, you're basically on life support. So yeah, you're so being eaten by a cocaine bear is basically what's happening. <laughs> that's, that's right. Fun fact about bears. I learned this. So if you are, if, if listeners get nothing out of this, uh, this is what you're going to get. If you ever come across a grizzly bear, uh, you can actually not necessarily fight back, but you have a chance. If you come across a black bear, just run. And then if you come across a polar bear, you just call it quits. Like you're absolutely done. I found that out a couple of days ago. So it's one of those useless facts that if you ever jump on Jeopardy, you're welcome for the $200. Now, I, you know, I at, normally preface financial stuff by saying I'm not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. Do your own research on this bear stuff. I'll say I'm not a zoologist. Um, do your own research because I don't want anyone to DM me and say, Mark, <laughs> my my son listened to Chris Panigoto on the podcast and uh, he was maimed and eaten foot first by a bear. So anyway, just to listen, bring a bear horn. What are you doing? Bring a yeah. bear horn and some bear spread. I will say it, the odds of you getting a DM like that, if that does happen, I'll feel really bad. But statistically speaking, the odds of that is probably statistically never. So if it does happen, I'm going straight to Vegas um, <laughs> just because like I'm, I'm going straight for the lotto. But back to number seven. So number seven, surface level, stub to toe. This one's a pretty easy one. Most business owners do not have the simplistic understanding of surrounding themselves with a great team. Now, for you and I that have been in business for, for a while, we know that there are players that you need. So the players that people will need on their team, first and foremost, is a CPA. You need to make sure that your taxes are all squared away. You need to know what you're going to structure your business as. That is critically important. And then as an attorney, you want to have a business attorney and an estate planning attorney in your back pocket. Um, a lot of people think I jump straight to the financial planner side because that's that's who I am. But frankly, until you have hope, and you're making money, chances are you're really not going to need to chat with a, a financial planner. You just want to get going. You want to make your money. And then you want the two uh, teammates that I just mentioned to pick up the pieces. I would say number six, because uh, th th this dovetails into number six, don't get wrapped up in the minutia. So when I started in business, I'm very thankful for this. First off, when you start in business, you have no money. And, and when you have no money and no hope, you have one goal, survive and make the bacon, which I love bacon. And, you know, for vegan listeners, you know, vegan bacon, but it's not as good. So everyone loves bacon. Even everyone vegan, loves, everyone bacon. loves bacon. It's just, it's everyone just natural. loves bacon. Yeah. So, so what I mean by that minutia is um, I, I made the mistake early on of thinking, okay, I need to niche. I need to get these, uh, I need to do SWOT analysis. I need to do all of these things that like, big companies do. That lasted about 48 hours because I realized that ain't going to make me any money. So don't get lost in the minutia. Get out there, hustle your butt off, and just make sure you survive. Number five. Hold on. I just got to stay on that for one minute because I think this is, is, is a really important point about getting out there and doing the damn sales because 90% of small businesses fail. 90%. Mm -hmm. May, the, actually, it might even be higher. Uh -huh. The vast majority are going to fail. So you could spend all this time putting out the perfect plan, the SWOT analysis, your balance sheet, you got everything, you got your butt, everything is set up, but everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. At the end of the day, I, I talk about this in my mastermind program a lot. 
do pick up the damn phone just stop <laughs> stop strategizing and marketing and thinking that the perfect logo is going to build your business pick up the damn phone okay sorry yeah. i just had to rant on that for a second all right that's number six out of the way pick up the damn no phone. totally rant away well and so once I, I will say though dovetailing off that once you start to pick up the phone and, and get out there stop worrying about the minutia i would say number five when your schedule is completely empty, just fill the schedule. That's a huge mistake that a lot of people make. And also realize that you need to maximize the 24 hours that you have. Now, a lot of that's very cliche, but I'm a quantifiable guy. So most people, you know, they wake up at whatever, six, seven, eight o'clock, they roll out of bed, and then they're scrambling to get going for the day. By the end of the day, um, they're still scrambling. And then, you know, if you've got a family, it, like it, it all compounds in the wrong direction. So one thing that I told myself early on, and I, I outside of what I do professionally, I, I have a passion for uh, bodybuilding. I've done that for 10 years. And so for me, it's like, okay, I'm going to wake up at 445. Now it gets a little different. And Mark and I were, were talking earlier, like I have a seven month old at home. So like sleep just goes out the window. But when I first started it, I was telling myself, okay, get up at 4.15, excuse me, be at the gym by 4.45, clang and bang in the iron paradise, get to the office by six o'clock, do two hours of research on my craft. So by the time eight o'clock comes, I can hit the ground running. I know exactly who I need to call, assuming I don't have a meeting. And then you just, you basically burn the candle from both ends. And a lot of people say, oh my gosh, you need work-life balance. If you want to be truly successful in this world, that's never going to happen. Now that's a curse. It is a curse, but it's a great curse to have. I'd much rather have that curse than the other side. Now, I don't think, by the way, I don't think it needs to be like that forever, but no. you can do this for a season. And, and yeah. by the way, I had this conversation with my wife. You know, I was talking to my wife about this. This was a few months ago. And she's like, Mark, I feel like you're not spending enough time with me. I'm like, listen, just left the day job a year ago. I, I, we got to dig in. This is a, there's a lot of opportunity here. Let's, let's paint the vision of where we're going. Let's get on the same page. We're going to have date night. We're going to fill out the schedule. And, and to your point, really important. I think that she and I, and, and your partners understand that this is not forever, mm -hmm. but for us, for a, for a time being, I'm trying to get the, I'm trying to get this business off the ground. I got it. Burn yeah. it to both ends to your point. Yeah. Well, and, and it's funny. My, uh, my wife and I were having this conversation a couple of nights ago. And, and, and like I was telling you, my, my personal financial planning business, I don't want to say it's on autopilot, but like we're getting incredibly uh, nitpicky on who we're working with. We've got minimums of half a million dollars. We want to work with business owners that have like-minded success or people that have retired from their business and have cashed out. And for me, it's at that point where I'm going, okay, it's not that I'm good, but I'm getting much more concentrated. But then with the brand, the podcast and the book and the speaking and all those fun things and the masterclass coming out December 1st, shout out to myself. I know that we're turning that corner and it's the same feeling I had after I'd say two years in the business where I'm going, okay, you're going on adrenaline. Most cars are running on empty, but you, you, you suddenly refilled the metaphoric adrenaline to a full tank of gas and you put that thing to the metal you put the pedal to the metal and you can't not take your eye off of the prize but it, it is tough and i'm so thankful i have the best wife in the world that understands that she is married to a psychopath that is going to stop at nothing to get to where not only i would like to be but more importantly where my family can be because i want my wife and my daughter to look back and go man i you know daddy slash you know husband is is pretty crazy but he did it out of the love for his people but then most importantly us and i think that's lost today um i like that another thing that i do w when it because i'm not a morning person i know in, in every i don't i don't think you have to be a morning person to be a successful entrepreneur you no, do need to exercise not. regularly that is important you, you yes. need to keep the, your body in shape otherwise you don't have the energy but one of the things that i do is i know i'm going to sleep in if i don't have anything to do so i schedule stuff as early as possible whether it's you know pt for my shoulder whether it's church groups whether it's mastermind programs meetings i i'll, I'll book it as early as possible that mm -hmm. way i get my ass out of bed i have no yep. i have if it's on the schedule i'm going to be if i say i'm going to do it i'm going to do it um in 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 
putting yourself in positions to be successful is I think an important part of that. It's a non-negotiable. And so, you know, going off of the the seven, so you had the number seven, surround yourself with the right team, CPA and attorney. Uh, number six, stop focusing on the uh, minutia. So number five, because I don't think we got into number five. Number fill the five, schedule. Fill, fill the, the schedule. schedule. Yeah, fill the schedule. So once you fill the schedule, then it, at that point, number four, understand the maximum return on investment that you will have with the time. So what I mean by that is you could go to a bunch of these. Um, so I'll, I'll use myself as an example. I knew that there were a ton of groups locally that um, like Chamber of Commerce, Rotary, things of that nature. My goal was to be at six networking events a week for the first two years because I need to be everywhere all the time. And I remember reading an article probably three months in or so by Michael Kitzes, who's a, a financial planning um, wizard in our industry. He talks about the business and all that. A little long in the tooth, but I'd rather have you be too long than too short. And he wrote this rule of the rule of three. So the first year in business, you become known. The second year, you become trusted. The third year, referrals come in from your I guess year one guinea pig clients and then year four after the compounding starts to take off. Now, for me, it took a little bit longer just due to the fact that, you know, I was a little bit younger, started for all practical purposes at 23 or 24, which is now capitalize your finances after leaving the big firms. And, you know, let's just face it, like people look at you and you're like, well, you're 23 and 24. You started this planning practice out of your apartment for all practical purposes and you, you don't really have any hope. Like it's a pretty tough sell, um, which leads me to after you understand, like you need to be everywhere all the time. At that point, people are going to start getting clients or prospective clients in their office or you go to them, whatever the case is. So we've got seven, six, five, uh, four. So I'd say number three is once you get them in the office, the common misconception people mess up is the fact that number one, you're still nervous that you can close them. Think about this. If someone took the time to come into your office or hop on a Zoom call or commit to meeting with you at their place of work, you've already got the sale because they, they're already interested. And so the misconception I've seen during that initial meeting is you're trying to hard sell them. Don't try to hard sell people. Try to genuinely connect with them because you're not, if you're starting a business, you're not going to win on the big brand name. You're not going to win on the fact that you've got this gar gargantuan experience behind your back. You don't have this massive team. You've got all of these things that you're going to lose. But the one thing that you can control always is genuine connection with everyday people. And that's what I learned early on. I like it's, that. Okay. And isn't it beautiful when you genuinely connect with someone because then this is what's going to happen. The word's going to get out and they're going to go, and I'm just going to use me. Why, why did you go with, with the cap and capitalize? Why did you go with Chris Paniotu? And they'll sit there. Now, I'm not you know, promoting myself here, but hypothetically, they could go, you know, he just, he just genuinely cares. And that's really cliche, but think about it. You connected with them more than any other person. Therefore, they trust you with their heart, which in turn uh, means they trust you with their business. And that leads to financial fulfillment. So that leads me to number two. As your business starts to rock and roll and you're not financially destitute, a lot of people think, okay, I can take my foot off the gas. Now, you mentioned this earlier, Mark, and I agree with you to an extent where people, they don't have to necessarily do the, you know, 16 hours a day, burning the candles from both ends, living on adrenaline, which I could argue was some of the most, those are some of the most exciting days in my career. Sure. Right. But I get it because there's more to life than just business. What I would disagree with is, and I've learned this from experience, I think of life as a scale. That's not a bodybuilding thing, but just metaphorically speaking, I thought, okay, once financially and professionally, the stress of making it or turning the corner was gone, the scale was just going to get lighter. I think in the life of business, the weight always stays the same, but what, what starts to fall off on one end will re be replaced by another weight. And it's all relative. 
And so what I would tell people is don't take your foot off the gas, but put your foot on the gas pedal in a much more strategic way. That's where I think people get uh, very misconstrued on the route that they need to go with business. But the biggest mistake by a mile that people make in business, and this is where I'm putting my professional hat on, is they don't understand where they can maximize their return on investment. Now, a lot of people are going to go, oh, this is where Chris is going to hook you and say, well, you just need to distribute money, send it to a financial planner. Wrong. A thousand percent wrong. So Mark, we've known each other for all of 30 minutes. Okay. And it's been a glorious 30 minutes, mind you. Okay. And so I don't know a ton about your business, but I've got a pretty good idea. So hypothetically, let's say you come to me and you go, Chris, right? You're my, my go-to financial planner. I'm like, thank you, Mark, for uh, promoting me on your show. But what can I do to help you? You know, our business is rocking and rolling. I've got like 50 grand and I don't know what to do with it. Now, here lies the issue where most planners, right? Nip you in the nuts. Metaphorically, they would go, okay, we'll take a distribution. We can maybe go and invest that, you know, whether it's in your 401k or in a stock or mutual fund or ETF portfolio or real estate or whatever the case is. That's wrong. So let's put our business owner hat on for a second. So I go, okay, Mark, well, so what are you earning on your marketing in your advertising? And you go, well, you know, if I put 50 grand into my marketing, it's probably going to take me three years ish to get that back. And I go, okay, that's where you're going. And let's do the quantifiable math behind that. So from an absolute return basis, that's a 33% return on your money. From a tax advantage standpoint, right? Mark is, you know, in the high mighty one of 1% here. So your tax bracket is 40%. Well, because of the generally accepting accounting principles gap, you can deduct all of that money in one year, marketing and advertising. You don't depreciate it over 15 years or however long. So you get a deduction right off the bat. So you're earning 40% today on the taxes you're not paying, not even including, you know, state or local taxes. But then you're also earning the absolute return of 33% on your money from a marketing standpoint, which in turn will add infinitely more to the value of your business, which in turn will add exponentially more to your net worth if you decide to eventually sell your business, which fun fact, 100% of businesses someday will be sold. Now, well, uh, so that's an interesting point too, now that we've got the influencer market. But I, I will say that, you know, for me, this is the this is one of the big advantages of being an entrepreneur because you're actually building something to sell one day. It's the difference yeah. between renting and owning. You're yeah. not going to get rich. Well, I'm not going to say you're not going to get rich leasing, but you you need to be building, creating, and owning something. And I I just got to I got to go in reverse a little bit because you kind of called me out, Chris, calling me out on being lazy basically and telling me <laughs> to take the foot off the gas, but but. I, Here's what happens. The, the mentality that people get wrong when it comes to starting a business is I want to start a business so I can have freedom to lay on a beach and drink margaritas on a Monday morning. That's not what happens. No. What, what ends up happening is you put into place processes, routines, discipline that it creates the success. And then that's your habit. You can't just take the foot off the gas after you've created a habit. It's it's like if you go to someone who's teaching you how to lose weight and they're like, listen, just stop eating for seven days. That ain't going to work. You're just going to put the weight right back on. What works is putting into place the right types of habits. They're going to give you that, that return long term. So I do think, however, creating a vision with your wife is important. Yes. In finding that routine and habit that works. And, and just to kind of roll that over and in, in, in dovetail into that final point that you made about where to, where to kind of put that money, you know, you, you might be taking your foot off the gas in one place, but now you're empowering others in another place. That, that, that's, that to me is the constant thing I'm always thinking about. How do I take this off of my plate and put it on someone else's plate so I can focus on the next thing. And that, that's kind of where my mentality is. As a business yeah. Owner. And, and maybe even re re uh, rephrasing, the whole idea. So you're always going to put down a hundred percent effort on that pedal, the foot on the gas pedal. But what happens is as you get better at your craft and money also plays into this, but, but not really, the more you progress in your craft, that effort will still be at a hundred percent. It's the sophistication of the effort that changes. And so a lot of people think, right? Cause I actually agree with you. 
Okay, I wasn't throwing shade on your show, especially on your own show, right? I'm a chivalrous. Hey, I'm open to it, baby. Right? We bring the heat here. You know, I'm yeah. open to debate. But like for for you, I I bet you, Mark, that obviously your day looks completely different today than when you started your show. 100%. But I bet you you're still putting in as much effort, but because you've built all of these mental models in your head, which I'm very big about. I talk about that on my show all the time. You can go through processes so much more efficiently. And so people would perceive you as maybe not putting as much effort in, but it's not. You got so many reps worn out. You don't even have to think of something. Whereas when you started, what took you or what takes you maybe five minutes today took you five hours when you started. And I think that's a huge misconception that people don't understand. But what's interesting is, and it dovetails off of that, that most, uh, egregious error that I mentioned about understanding where you can earn the the return on your investment. Business owners in many ways are some of the best asset allocators, like dollar allocators I've ever met. And, and, And they don't know how to invest. Okay. There's a huge difference, but once they can unlock that and understand just that basic analogy that I told you about, that's where they can start to really catapult. Now, one uh, example I didn't really mention is, and I'm just going to use you as an example. Okay. So we talked about the 33%, 40% tax, blah, blah, blah. Well, let's say I come to you and I go, okay, Mark, well, like, let's look at your business. And I love when advisors or, or not really advisors, cause they're kind of dying off. If, if you, if you have a financial advisor, just fire them and hire Google, just Google. I got it. chat GPT. What do I need? A, a yeah. You got chat GPT. For? I'll tell you this <laughs> financial planning related though. If you have a true, a true planner, that is one of, going to be one of the most invaluable assets ever. And what I mean by that is, let's say you look at your business and you are, are your business in theory has matured so much that you have nowhere else to go with that hypothetical 50 grand that we were talking about. That's where it becomes a, okay, your business is basically maximized where it can get to in, in theory. So that's where you start taking distributions. And if you're a publicly traded stock, that's why you see all these companies that pay dividends every year and they increase it every year because they have literally nowhere else to go prudently within the business. And so, you know, in that case, you know, you take uh, money and instead of investing in the SME 500, you're investing in the SMP 500 or, you know, actual investments outside of you. But that, that I've, I have seen business owners and this happens all the time, burn hundreds of thousands of dollars because they keep thinking, oh, I'm going to keep reinvesting into the business because that's what got me to where I'm at. But in return of that, they've hit that peak and now they're actually losing a return on their own investment, which is really sad. And I think a lot of that has to do with what phase in your business is in its life cycle. And am I capped out? Do I want to hire an entire C-suite? Do I want to stay a mom and pop? Where's the best place for my business to stay. Um, should I just put it all on Bitcoin or maybe Dogecoin? I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. So is that is that number one, continuing to double down on what's worked in the past without looking at what's going to work in the future? Like what's the number one mistake financially that business owners make? Give me number one. Yeah. The number one mistake that business owners make by a mile is not understanding when it makes sense to stop reinvesting in the business and instead taking money to reinvest in themselves outside of the business. I like that. And and it's certainly not obvious. It's also like a really confusing thing. There's like a million places to put your money. Thankfully, mm-hmm. ChatGPT just gave me some recommendations. So I'm good. But you as a listener, you might not. It might be worth investigating a little bit further. Uh, Chris, before we close down here, I have one more question. Before we, Where's the best place for us to find you before I lay this final number one question on you? Absolutely. So for you out there that are listening in to the lovely Adonis, that is Mark Savant. If you want to get a copy of my book, Capitalize Your Finances, the how-to financial framework that takes you from compoundingly clueless to monetarily magnificent, head on over to amazon.com, type in Capitalize Your Finances, and support my daughter's eventual college fund. You're welcome in advance. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can go on to Spotify, Apple Pod, or YouTube, Type in Capitalize Your Finances. That is also the title of our show. And if you just want to follow me on social media, you can go to LinkedIn, Twitter, or X, or Instagram. Type in either Cap and Capitalize 
or my name, Christopher Paniotu. Shoot me a DM, ask me any question you want. And then lastly, if for whatever reason you would like to become a client of Capitalize Your Finances, the planning business, assuming you're a credit investor and you hit the minimums, head on over to capitalizeyourfinances.com. Shoot us a DM in my amazing teammate slash assistant, Betty. We'll get back to you and get you on the books. Shout out to Betty. Shout out to Betty. Betty, you're doing the Lord's work. Thank you very, very, very much. There has ever been a truer statement than what you just said. She is doing the Lord's work. And her <laughs> joke always is, there is not enough hazard pay in this, on this earth to, to send my way. Um, I will say really fun, fun fact. So we always promote on, you know, paying our people right and all that. And of course, I, I always feel guilty because there's not enough that I feel like I can even give back to Betty because she's given me so much. So a couple of weeks ago, just really quick tangent. And I know we're wrapping up with the last question. Uh, so we have our payroll company. I'm not going to name drop because they, they kind of screwed up. And, you know, in Washington State, the minimum wage is whatever it is, $15 an hour. And that's a whole nother story. And so I called because I wanted, you know, Betty to have, have a bonus. And I'm like, okay, I call. Everything's all set up and squared away. And, and Betty calls me and, and she goes, you know, um, and, 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 and Betty is one of the most grateful people I've ever met in my life. And, and we just, we work well together. I mean, she's family that happens to be employed. That's how I view her and any employee I'm going to bring on. And she kind of was around the bush saying, you know, like, like, like $200 hit like my, my bank account or something like that. Like, is there, is there a, a, a mistake? And I don't know what happened, but the payroll company corrected it where she was getting paid and we, we got it fixed, but like $2 and 85 cents an hour. So now the, the internal joke within capitalized, right. And we always laugh is like, you know, Hey, what's the, what's the minimum wage, right. That is paid. I'm like, well, in Washington state, it's 15 an hour, but at capitalize your finances, it's $2 and 85 cents. You really got to climb the, the corporate ladder. So that was a fun it's little like the, tangent. It's like the restaurant business model where you just get paid tips, you get paid pennies and then tips on the yeah. back. And I will say, you know, we didn't list this as number one, but number one business mistake, Chris, what are you doing? Building a business, not in Florida. Florida is the place to build your business. We've got no state tax. It is legit. I don't know what people are thinking. Starting yeah. Businesses in other States. Yeah, no, I, I, I get it. Actually, it's funny. I mean, in, in one hand, Washington state, you know, cause we don't have a state tax. Uh, we don't have a local tax. So that's kind of nice. Uh, I know we don't have enough time to get into this, but there's a, a ton of cons on the other side of that. Um, and it's funny, we actually have family in Florida. So, and we have clients in Florida. That's the cool thing about my business, right? Like you can kind of go wherever, but uh, yeah, you never know. You never know what's going to happen in the world. Ooh, ooh, maybe a, a sneak peek there. Okay, final question here for yes. you, Chris. Bitcoin, going to a million or going to zero? Oh my God, dude, I have no clue. And I'll tell you, so- you, I don't know if your listeners are going to just, you know, virtually crucify me for this. So I have never touched cryptocurrency. And a lot of people think, oh my gosh, you know, like you're against it. Uh, and I'm like, well, no. But then people will go, well, that means you're for it. And I go, well, no. So in investing, when, and again, this is a huge difference between planning and investing. So putting my investment hat on, your greatest gift is your greatest curse. That's one of my favorite quotes of all time. And so what I like to do, mental model in my head, is that the greatest gifts outweigh the greatest curses, then it's worth my time to look into. So what is cryptocurrency in general? Forget Bitcoin for a second. Cryptocurrency is a currency. And for me, I like easy wins. So a couple of years ago, people asked me like, okay, what's your favorite cryptocurrency? And I jokingly said Kimberly Clark. It just happens to be a stock that I've owned. And they produce toilet. Toilet paper, and, and you can you can feel the host getting agitated with that because this guy, I mean, I'm pretty sure he has a Bitcoin tattoo on his back, like he's all in. And I told him, I go, well, here's the deal. Kimberly Clark produces toilet paper and diapers, which we are now a huge supporter of in the household, and um, for my daughter, not for me. So <laughs> for for me, I looked at that, going, okay, so. This business is very successful. I think it's pretty safe to say that you and I have used Kimberly Clark's products within the last 72 hours. And if not, you should probably call a doctor. But side note from the joke, everyone is using it. There really aren't any competitors. It's a pretty established company. So if things are really, really good, economically speaking, people are going to need it. If things are really, really bad, 
right? And people are literally shitting their pants. They're probably going to use more of it, right? So it's a kind of, it's a nice little hedge. It's not really going anywhere. So here lies the issue with currency. All currency is, forget cryptocurrency, currency is just a tool to go and, and trade for goods and services. Now, I know of all the thesis, thesis is, thesis I, that, you know, Bitcoin and all these cryptocurrencies have, and eventually, right, they could could potentially replace, well, it's the dollar, yen, euro, et cetera, and become the universal currency. Well, if a business is really good, you will do anything in your power to pay for those goods of services in any currency that is out there. So for me, it's more of a concept of I'm not against it, but I'm not necessarily for it. I just know it's a, it goes into the too hard pile for me. Well, right. I, I, thank you for the most political non-answer of all time, Chris. I appreciate that. But is it going to zero to a million? Give me your hot take, bro. Dude, I have no idea. I would say this, okay? Because it's really not, honestly, I'm like the most least political person out there. But but if I had to say between a million or zero, if you're asking for the absolute, I'd lean towards zero. Towards zero, okay. Yeah, I'd lean. And the reason why, and again, this isn't political, this is just fact of the matter, the odds of one cryptocurrency becoming the dominant, assuming that even happens, it is statistically getting closer and closer to zero every day because there are more cryptocurrencies being released daily. So the odds from a competition standpoint, just statistically speaking, are becoming limited, limited, limited. When Bitcoin and, I don't know, Ethereum were like the big two, what were the odds that Bitcoin became the, the number one winner? 50%, right? Like, like assuming that happened, then you get three out there. It's 33%, four, 25. Well, not exactly. Not exa I mean, the, the Bitcoin is pot. You know, the only reason cryptocurrency or gold or silver are popular is because people see them as a store of value. But when you see Larry Fink from BlackRock saying, Hey, we're getting into Bitcoin, Michael Saylor, Bitcoin, heck, you know, the world is not necessarily like, or trust the United States. You've got right. uh, the, the BRICS uh, connection and you've got, you know, China, Brazil, Russia, they're like, ah, we want to get off the U.S. dollar. We're going to create our own thing. If the U.S. dollar tanks, you know, Bitcoin could go to the moon. So I'm not saying to go out. I'm not a financial advisor. It's not financial advice. You should do your research. <laughs> I'm not saying Bitcoin for yeah. sure is going to a million, but that's my stance. I think like if it's going to go somewhere, I, I don't think it goes to zero, but it could. But, well, here's my thing, say. right? And I get where you're going with that. And I, I actually agree with what you were saying, but. I'll even double down on, on another topic that you brought up. So you brought up like gold, silver, you didn't bring up like copper, lumber, oil, like but commodities, right? Like things in general, right. they store money. I learned this early on. So gold has been around forever. Um, fun fact, if you go back to, I think it was like 1892, I have this, this research at my office. I'm going off memory here. Gold, silver, and copper, like the ore commodities are the only asset class that have actually lost to the dollar from a rate of return standpoint over that entire period of time, which is very mm -hmm. fascinating. Now, from a common sense standpoint, let's say that my phone was a, a, a ore, right? Or a piece of lumber or whatever. Forget the fact that it can be, um, it, it, it can be, uh, you know, manufactured into something that is producing. But if that rock or that plank just sat there, for 10 years, it didn't do anything. And for me, and again, this is my you know surface level thinking here, I've always been a proponent, assuming a long-term investment, of investing in something that does something. So for me, it just happens to fit within my, my thesis of understanding. I could be dead wrong on Bitcoin. In fact, I probably will be, okay? But it's also not within my framework, my, my circle of competence, if you will. For me, I know that the businesses that I own or the funds that I own, and not only do I own, but I own on, on behalf of clients or the clients own and we're managing it prudently. I know that they're not going anywhere per se. Like they're, they're going to be there. They're producing things. And, you know, that actually brings something up as another mistake that I think a lot of people make. This is a bonus for, for you and your listeners. Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's business partner, who could very well be dead by the time of this recording because he is a million years old. Um, he brought up, this was maybe six or seven years ago at the Berkshire conference. He's always told himself, I'm trying to earn myself a net of tax return of 6% in the long run. 
Now, and, and his joke was, I just overshot. <laughs> Okay, which is like yeah, I don't even think you're joke. keeping up with infl- with inflation at that at that number, but you know, yeah. to be fair, I'll give it to him. But like for from an investment standpoint, fair, sure. right? Not from like a business standpoint because I could do the math on all that and how much our business has grown and how your business has grown. But like once you're taking distributions, you're reinvesting it somewhere. Like that should be the bare bone minimum from a long term side of things because statistically speaking, you can't help but eventually become successful. Now. For me, I've looked at that going, okay, what I appreciated with that, and he didn't say it directly, but he said it indirectly. I would much rather be one of the last to be right than the first to be wrong. And as a planner, I can tell you it's 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 easy for people to try to get hooked onto whatever the next best thing is. But one, one of the things I talk about in my book and on my show is people go for like the home run, but you know... All you need is four singles and you're still going to hit a home run. And my whole point with that is people are missing the easiest wins right in front of their face. And that's where you see a lot of financial detriment occur because people try to swing for the fences and get ahead of their skis and compounding works in every aspect of your life. So if you start striking out, striking out, striking out, this isn't baseball where all you need is one home run and you're golden in real life you know, you're, you're, you're striking out, you're striking out, you're striking out. What happens is you start to compound the bad habits and that's where you start to get really desperate. I'm not saying everyone that invests in cryptocurrency is going that route, but I've just seen that more often than not. From, from a business standpoint though, like, you know, it takes 19 failures to get that one win. Like that's, that's part of it. You know, entrepreneurs, we're going to be more risk tanking by nature. Um, and it, but I agree, like you saw a lot of people get roped up in FTX and NFTs and a ton of other get rich quick scams. So I'm, I'm with you there. Going with the get rich quick way is a good way to uh, lose your lunch. Feel yeah. you on that one. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I, I definitely would say it's risky to go all in on Bitcoin. Um, you, you, you can't take a bath with Bitcoin like you can with dollar bills, mm-hmm. right? As we've seen with Scrooge McDuck from DuckTales. Um, but one of the things that you can do with Bitcoin is you can store it right in your cranium. Mm-hmm. You don't need, a, you only need anything. You can cross borders without anything in your pockets. You only need to hide it in your socks or anything. You don't, you could take, as long as you know your code and it's in your head, you could take it anywhere. I think there's a lot of value to that too. If, uh, you know, if all the currencies go dark, you know, you can, you can take it with you wherever you go. Maybe you're an immigrant, you're fleeing an oppressive regime crossing borders. As long as you know your your wallet address, you can take it with you wherever you want. I think there's a lot of advantage to that. I don't know. We'll see. There is. This is what I would say, like putting like the 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 the, the bow on top of it. For your listeners, I'm actually not a, and, and people are gonna be like, oh my gosh, you know, Chris is totally against cryptocurrency. I'm not. Everyone I'm not DM against- Chris right now. Oh, DM gonna, Chris yeah. right now and tell him how wrong he is. Right. Uh go to Instagram. It's Capin Capitalize. And tell Chris Chris, you're wrong about Bitcoin, bro. Yeah. Bitcoin's here's, to the moon. Here's my thing though. So for me, I'm not for it. I'm not against it. And and the reason why I say that is with what I do. If I have any bias towards one side or the other, I'm not doing my duty on behalf of my clients. I, I, I literally can't, right? Because the second you have an emotional bias toward it, then you're starting to dance with the devil. What I'm going to tell your listeners, and I tell everyone this, because I have some of my best friends in the business, okay, have extraordinarily compelling thesis or thesi, okay? I don't know what the plural is, uh, <laughs> on... Whatever it is, cryptocurrency. Uh, I've met people that are really big into oil, lumber. I've met people big into whatever it is, Tesla. Like I could go down the list. As long as you critically and profoundly think about writing a thesis of fill in the investment name, that is what's going to matter the most to you. And I think all of your listeners are going to agree with that. So if you've got a compelling thesis as to why Bitcoin should be part of your portfolio and your net worth, good for you. And therefore you should go for it. One of the best, uh, uh, interviews on my show that I wish got more popularity was when I interviewed Dr. Craig Israelson, who's the head of finance at BYU. He's one of my favorite researchers and he's an astounding man. I talk about him in my book extensively. And one of the themes that he talks about to his, uh, students 
in the world of planning is uh, everyone loves salsa. So some people like it sweet, some people like it fruity, some people like it spicy. But as long as you find out your salsa, if that works for you, you're, you're going you're gonna to come out on top. It's the same thing. As long as you understand your thesis from a, a wealth building perspective and you have conviction and it's not emotional, right? You have actual evidence on your frame of reference in your circle of competence. I say go for it. Learning to reason. Learning to reason. Yeah. I'm with you there. Yeah. Look at the facts, look at the data, look at the reasoning, and uh, make sure that you DM on Instagram, Capin, capitalize with your opinion on Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. He wants to know. I do. I want to know. I do. I want to know, <laughs> I want to know what that opinion on, on Bitcoin is. Uh, Chris, thanks for joining the show today. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me.